When I was little, my father was famous. He was the greatest samurai in the empire. He cut off the heads of 131 lords. He was the greatest samurai in the empire. And he took me with him. Hey, everybody. I saw a couple of videos from D Marble recently that I thought I'd respond to. Well, not so much respond to as used as a springboard. Now, you can think what you want about young Mr. Marble, but I happen to like some of the questions he asks. The conclusions he comes to are incorrect, but the questions he asks often make room for a proper clarification of the globe reality. He's a good springboard to get to the facts. He was talking about how it was laughable to him that people think that the Earth is spinning. He said that he thought if he was sitting next to a globe supporter and there was a ceiling fan turning above them, he would say, hey, I guess you think that fan is standing still and we're spinning around it. Because in the real world, we don't feel any movement and we see other things move, the stars, the sun, the moon, but you think we're the ones moving. So when you see us sitting still here and that fan moving, you must think we're moving and it's not, <laughs> right? He's repeated this scenario a number of times, so I think he's pretty proud of it. Funny thing is, there's information in that scenario that we can compare to both the established globe model and the flat earth claim that will tell us that the earth is moving like the fan. I'm just going to talk you through this thought experiment and you picture what you can in your mind. Okay. All right. First, let's do a flat earth scenario. We're not moving and the fan is the heavens uh, rotating above us. Now, the fan isn't big enough to be the full sky above us, so we'll use a little phone uh, camera to represent us. Now, bend the blades down a bit, uh, so it's more like this, and it's rotating around. Got it in your mind? Good. Now, we stick our phone camera up in here, like this, and it represents us standing on a flat earth with a rotating sky above. So what do we see? Well, if we follow different points in the sky, we see they're tracing out a circle. The more we face the center of the sky, which we'll call north, the smaller the circles get around the central point. The farther away from the central point, the bigger the circles get. And even if we face toward the south, and when we look out level with the surface of our flat plane world, that outermost circle looks just like a line to us. But no matter where we place ourselves in this case, the center of those circles is back at the north point. The sky has one point of rotation. That's what things would look like if we weren't rotating and the sky was. For the next scenario, we put our camera representing us on top of the blades and let it rotate with them. What is seen then? Well, it's a lot like our other scenario. All the points in the room uh, in view, in this case the ceiling, seem to rotate around a central point in a direction we'll call north. Smaller circles near the center point, bigger ones further out. If we put the camera on the edge of the fan looking out, equidistant between the top and the bottom, the equator, if you will, points of the sky, in this case the walls, trace out straight lines. Then, if we secure that phone camera to the bottom of the fan, we see the objects of the sky, in this case the floor, tracing out circles that are centered around another point, not the same point as before. The sky has two central points of rotation, one that's seen when facing one direction, and another that's seen when facing the opposite direction. Question is, which scenario reflects what is actually seen in the real world? Well, in the real world, that central point is called the celestial pole, and we have two, a northern celestial pole and a southern one. Globe deniers claim the southern celestial pole doesn't exist because if it does, it doesn't match their flat earth scenario and breaks their claim. Once again, the existence of two celestial poles breaks the flat earth claim, and they know it, so they claim it doesn't exist. They recognize that this exists. This is the northern sky making star trails. Now, this isn't my image, so I can't 100% vouch for it. But this is my image. This is the northern sky from the Oakland Hills just a couple days ago. A brief time lapse here shows that there is a central point that these stars are rotating around. 
I had to stop because cloud cover came in, but the center of rotation, the northern celestial pole, is right next to Polaris there. But as I said, globe deniers embrace the existence of the northern celestial pole that I showed here. It's this that they say doesn't exist. This is the southern sky as seen from near Perth, Australia back in January. These images were taken by myself and Critical Think. So these are not hearsay images. I was there operating one of two cameras. There's the Southern Cross, a constellation you cannot see looking north. Polaris is obviously nowhere to be seen. Some globe deniers try to claim that this is somehow a reflection of the Northern Pole. But if it were, we would see the same stars and we don't. A brief time lapse here and we can see that all the stars are rotating around a central point a southern celestial pole. This is what globe deniers refuse to say is a real thing, because try as they might, there is no scenario that they can come up with that has a sky, uh, a dome, uh, uh, whatever they want to call it, rotating over a stationary Earth that has more than one point of rotation. I defy you globe deniers to present a flat model that has two celestial poles, one due north and one due south. But you won't, because you can't. Because this is evidence that the Earth is rotating like D. Marble's fan. In another video, Mr. Marble talked about centrifugal force, using a merry-go-round as an example of how when a person is on a rotating surface, there's more outward pushing centrifugal force uh, the further out from the center of rotation the person is. He noted that if the Earth was spinning, there would be more outward force near the equator compared to near the North Pole. He says he's been in places near the equator, yet he's felt no difference in the forces acting on him. In other words, he's felt no lighter. Again, this is a great springboard into globe evidence. Now, according to the globe model, there is a great amount of gravitational force acting towards the center of the globe. Well, it's great compared to the amount of centrifugal force due to the spin of the Earth which is only enough force to negate about 0.3% of an object's weight compared to the poles, if we calculate for a, a perfect sphere, a bit more with an ellipsoid uh, Earth. Not only that, the equator is the only place where the centrifugal force is in line with the force of gravity and has its maximum effect. Uh, as I show here, not only does the centrifugal force decrease as the radius of the rotation decreases, since the gravity's vector is toward the center of the Earth and centrifugal force vector is out from the point of rotation, the force from the Earth spin affects gravity even less as you go north or south. Can that effect be measured? Yes, it can. Just take a scale and a known weight to different latitudes on the Earth and see if there is a difference, which is exactly what I did. I took one kilogram of weight and a scale on my world trip and weighed them in Oakland, Perth, uh, Sao Paulo, and Bogota, Colombia, the last being only 4.7 degrees above the equator. Now, before I give my results, I want to point out that Critical Think, who was with me on one leg of this trip, recently put out a video with weight measurements he took, and he plotted the data in graphical form and showed what was expected using Walter Bislin's centrifugal force calculator. Now, I did use that calculator to calculate the expected uh, percentage difference in weight, but if you want to see the calculator in action, go watch Critical Think's video. There's a link in the description. So, given the information I had for each location, I was able to use Bislin's calculator to get these expected changes from my Oakland measurement. The expectation is that the closer to the equator, uh, the less weight, the farther away, more. I'll speed through the weighing footage here. The one kilogram weight weighed 1,000.7 grams in Oakland. That's my baseline weight here. In Perth, which is ever so slightly closer to the equator than Oakland, that same mass weighed 1,000.4 grams, 99.97% of the Oakland weight. In Sao Paulo, which is even closer to the equator, it weighed 999.5 grams, 99.88% of Oakland. And lastly, in Bogota, nearest the equator, where they almost confiscated my weights and nearly screwed up this whole endeavor, it was 998.2 grams, 99.75% of the Oakland measurement almost precisely the expected change to the weight of an object at that latitude. 
In fact, the average difference between the expected measurements and the actual measurements was 1 50th of 1%. This is the centrifugal force at work in just the manner that Daryl was wondering about. Because the Earth, just like D. Marble's merry-go-round and his ceiling fan, is spinning. Now I know you globe deniers out there will still ask, how can you believe that the Earth is spinning, Jerry? Because I can say that I have witnessed two celestial poles of the Earth with my own eyes and recorded them for you to see. And I have measured and recorded the change in weight of objects on Earth due to centrifugal force. I have facts. What do you got? That's my job! That's what I do! I don't lose! I win! I win! Is there no one on this planet to even challenge me? Maybe you came by to congratulate me on last night's victory.